My name is Lukiet Sandal. I'm a visiting fellow at the Watson Institute for International Studies. And I am really excited about the panel for various reasons because one, um, the topic is something really relevant to our lives in general. But when we, we say boundaries, it is not only state boundaries, but also the boundaries we face in our societal lives, in our personal lives. So um, the panelists are coming from different backgrounds, which is also very exciting. We have got uh, anthropology scholars, history, Africana, international relations, and econ represented, so it will be fun. Um, and yes, believe it or not, we also uh, managed to uh, make this a consistent whole. So uh, I also want to encourage all of us, uh, both for the discussion session and in general, to think about these issues of our boundaries and our borders when it comes to our nationality, gender issues, social justice, or even when with our uh, relations with other species sometimes. So. When you are listening to the very interesting presentations, also think about like how it represents uh, how this notion of borders um, and uh, boundaries represent themselves in your own lives, so that we can have this discussion when the presentations are over. Um, and um, I will I will just give a very brief uh, introduction to the panelists, and they will uh, tell you more about themselves and their plans and their presentations. So we will start with Kara White, um, an anthropology senior, and she will talk about, um, she will present a quite unusual take on the topic uh, with the title Getting Closer to Felinges in Human-Cat Relations. Um, this is amazing, by the way. I very much look forward to that. Um, and then uh, Tara Prender Guest and Jesse McLaughlin will uh, present Bridging Borders, Relationships as Social Justice. Um, so Tara is from history and Jess is from Africana and uh, they are uh, working with uh, Brown Refugee Youth Tutoring and Enrichment, a student group that facilitates tutoring and mentoring between Brown students and refugees in Providence. So their presentation will discuss boundaries in that respect. Uh, last but not least, we, will, uh, we have Vasundra Prasad. Um, who will present her work on um, the problem in Kashmir, the problem of Kashmir, tracing the 60-year-old conflict in Indian subcontinent and its implications for regional and global security. So the presenters will confine their remarks to uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And in the end, we will have, again, 15 to 20 minutes uh, uh, slot to dis discuss, our, discuss the implications and uh, if you have any questions for the presenters. They will, um, they will take these questions, but we will aim to um, finish at 12.45. And we'll start with Kara. So this is the title for my actual thesis. Um, and say the cat responded, uh, getting closer uh, to the feline geese. Um, so you might be wondering, uh, what is the feline gaze? Um, in Lacanian terms, it implies a subject with the power to look, actively constituting itself as it looks upon others. In this particular picture of Chico, which unfortunately you can't see very well, um, his gaze is rendered very powerful as his face is centered on and his large yellowish eyes gaze directly into my cell phone that I was hovering over his head in an attempt to get a clear picture of him. Um, but what is beyond that stare, that act of looking? As I am being looked at, the object of his gaze rendered in this photo, are there thoughts pondering and wondering what I am doing waving this black object in his face, saying, Chico, Chico, look at me, Chico. Um, in short, what are the subjectivities that lay beyond his gaze, that inform it, that construct it? This was the question I began uh, when I decided to study the human-cat relationship within an animal shelter. The field of multi-species ethnography has been exploding with many new and very interesting explorations into, the, into including the non-human within the study of human worlds. From much earlier studies, like Geertz's notes on the Balinese cockfight, where the actual animals that form the center of this practice, the cockfight, are largely absent um, to, the multi to the multitudinous ways of looking at the Matsutake mushroom as a collaborator proposed by the Matsutake World Research Group. 
Kirksey and Helmerich in 2010 co-produced a special issue of the journal Cultural Anthropology to bring these new types of studies to the forefront and to highlight their contributions to multi-species worlding. Multi-species ethnography is like the usual ethnography you see in anthropology. Ethnography is a written work, but it also refers to a, a methodology of participant observation. Multi-species ethnography tries to include non-human lives within the social and political lives of the humans um, within which their lives are intertwined. <coughs> Why is it important to include the non-human in the study of human social worlds? In Haraway's words, quote, if we appreciate the foolishness of human exceptionalism, then we know that becoming is always becoming with, in a contact <coughs> zone where the outcome, where who is in the world is at stake, end quote. This human exceptionalism is the idea that we as humans are somehow separate from the rest of the natural world. That we are not in a world that is defined and constructed by many organisms in a multi-species web of becomings and encounters. Not only do we engage in multi-species encounters with other animals, such as cats, dogs, parrots, chinchillas, and other animals kept as pets in the contemporary American household, we are also an assembly of microbes and bacteria that allow our biological existence to be possible. Uh, staying for a moment with Chico, this is a picture I took of the biographical card that adorns each cat's cage at the shelter. Each card was written by a shelter employee or volunteer in the first person, using I. It is almost as if Chico is writing to address you, the one who may take him home. Um, since you can't really see that, it says, I am a six-year-old buff collared tiger who was adopted from the RISPCA eight months ago, but was brought back on 11 11 My owner said I didn't want to play with their children, and I wanted to go outside all the time. Because of this, I would do best in an adult home where I can be an indoor-outdoor cat. Do you have any mice you would like me to catch for you? I am neutered and up-to-date on my vaccinations. This is a form of constructing a cat's subjectivity using what is known about his personal history. Much of this information is taken from the paperwork that is filled out by whomever comes in to relinquish the cat to the shelter. In Chico's case, he was relinquished twice, unfortunately. The volunteers and employees who were there would often um, develop their own ideas of the individual personalities of each cat. One volunteer who came in every day would, could re uh, recite the entire history and background of each cat there, beyond what was written on these cards. She could also tell any interested vis visitor what she had observed, which was often at odds with the information card, and was especially and she was especially adept at matching cats and humans based on these habits and inclinations. This is one way of determining the cat's subjectivities, by piecing together known bits of information about a cat's past, along with what is currently observed about the cat. We can get an idea of who this cat is, what his personality is like, and how well he might fit into someone's home, for instance. Um, for Chico, he was an especially friendly cat. He would jump on anyone's lap um, who called his name, and he had this adorable habit of licking everyone's face and purring. Um, he even seemed to enjoy uh, being carried around, which is kind of interesting. But in my study, I wanted to go further than this. I wanted to go beyond just constructing a cat's personality based on this information. In any interaction, um, one must take the position of the other to determine the intentions, goals, and desires of the person one is at interacting with. In play especially, one must, take, one must understand the goals of the game and the acceptable moves or actions allowed. In order to successfully play, both the human and non-human must in some rudimentary way take the role of the other to act and adjust their actions on that basis. This effect is especially pronounced between a human and companion animal over time. These close interspecies friendships form the basis by which a relationship is built. This interspecies knowing allows the two species to interact with each other with relative ease and predictability. For I'm quite sure that my own cat knows my daily schedule and habits better than I do, and based on this understanding she has of me, she knows exactly when to beg for food for maximum effect. 
The interesting thing about an animal shelter is that in most cases, these close relationships have not had a chance to form. This cat here is Sasha. Um, he's also orange, but not the same cat as Chico. Um, he was the lucky cat to get access to the sunroom, which you can see on the right. Um, you can almost see him in the window there, lounging in the sun. One instance of human-cat interaction that I used in my thesis was a non-verbal communicative moment be between Sasha here and a little girl about five years old. She was visiting the shelter with her family that day and was very, very shy around Sasha. Her mother told me that they didn't currently have any pets. In this instance of Sasha and the little girl, they had just met and were using what little they knew about each other and perhaps a general knowledge of the other species um, to judge the other's actions and react appropriately. This differed in many ways uh, from what you could expect from a child who had grown up with a cat and played and otherwise interacted with that cat on a daily basis. In this shared transspecies habitus, Sasha had to become human in a limited way to take on the role of the other, in this case, a human child. This entanglement of human-cat becomings also reveals, to a limited extent, Sasha's own subjectivities. Because I can't interview a cat, I am left with the actions, vocalizations, and interactions of a particular cat, and left with the task of interpreting those nonverbal signs. Can we ever know what a cat's subjectivities are? Can we ever know what another person's subjectivities are? Living in a social world means that we make assumptions about the people we interact with, that they have similar thoughts, emotions, and motivations that we do. We use these assumptions to base our actions and communication upon when going through life as a social creature. It is often said that when trying to understand the subjectivities of other species, it is impossible because we would just be anthropomorphizing them. That is, we would be mapping human desires and emotions and goals onto the bodies of cats in our desire to understand them. In my field work at the animal shelter, this was most certainly the case, and many miscommunications occurred as a result. But what if cats are doing the same thing? What if when we look, what if when they look at one of us, they are mapping on their own cat subjectivities onto us and ultimately responding to us as they would a cat. Wouldn't that then reveal some of their own subjectivities in the process of interacting with one of us? That's it. Well, thank you all for coming out on this Saturday morning. There are probably some of the few people who are out about. Um, we are going to be talking about borders in a different context, but there's, I think, a connection that we will get back to in the end um, to some of the things that Kara has been talking about. Um, so it's exciting to see that there are some bright tu former and current tutors out in the audience. So Jesse and I are going to be talking about Bright, which is an extracurricular activity. Um, and we have both been involved with the program for a couple of years as tutors ourselves and also as coordinators. And so we're going to be speaking um, about borders and boundaries within this context and suggesting ways in which um, the model of this program helps to sort of push, I wouldn't say overcome, but push some of the borders. And we think that this is important because borders, as Nuket was saying, are very real in the world and have a lot of consequences for people. So we think it's a really important thing to consider. In any way, in any way borders. So what do we mean by borders? We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna then explain Bright, the model, the context, and then discuss what we mean by relationships as social justice and um, talk about the power. So there are sort of four kinds of borders in the work that we do. And the first is geographic. Um, as you can see, this is where families that we work with come from in the world. So there are obviously a lot of borders, geographical borders, that the population of refugees we work with um, have dealt with in their lives. And people are also coming from many different cultural backgrounds. 
So there are cultural differences that affect a lot of what Bright does. <coughs> um, the second geographical border that we think is perhaps even more important and, and a part of what Bright does is actually more local. And that's between College Hill, the red, and South Providence, which is the blue marker on this map. So um, students who do Bright travel into South Providence to do their work, um, thereby sort of bridging, crossing the bridge from where we are on College Hill into the city, and thus crossing that <gasps> border. We think that another border is a language border or barrier. So when we're thinking about the families that we're working with, for a lot of parents, it's a real barrier not to be able to communicate with schools. So you know, uh, school forms are coming home in English and in Spanish, but they're not coming home in Burundi or in Kunama. And so for a lot of parents to be able to advocate for their children, there's a real barrier in terms of access to knowledge and, and access to those sort of information about their kids and their kids' lives, which obviously affects the ability to have agency over you know, your future and your family's future. And then the second border we want, uh, sorry, the fourth, is um, access. So thinking about sort of um, access to things like education, to healthcare, to after school programming. And you know, when we, we think about the different borders and boundaries, we think that sort of language really um, affects the ability to access resources. And so these are, these are really interconnected um, questions and issues. Um, and I, I want to give the example of a five-year-old student who um, now has a bright tutor, but she ended up not being in school until October because she had lead poisoning and forms were coming home about registering her in school, but there, you know, no one was reading the forms and, and people didn't realize she was school age. So there was just, you know, that's an example of the way these issues are confounding um, on each other. So now we want to tell you what we do, Brown Refugee Youth Tutoring and Enrichment, Bright. Um, and we want to first read the mission to you. Um, so Bright empowers refugee youth to overcome academic and social obstacles during a critical time of transition. Our one-on-one -on -one in home tutoring model fosters strong and stable relationships through which youth access foundational knowledge to succeed in school and thrive in their new community. So we have um, a value that is strong in that mission statement where we have this bi-directional learning. And that's really what frames the philosophy of our, of our program. And that's this idea that we have a lot to learn from the people that we, you know, us Brown students going and doing tutoring and mentoring have a lot to learn and are constantly learning from the families and individuals that we work with. Um, people are coming from a lot of different language backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and so we learn a lot about new foods. And a lot of families we work with speak five languages, so there's an opportunity for us to learn languages. Um, and I know for me personally, I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, this is a former fight coordinator. <laughs> I've seen him a long time. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount um, from just seeing people's adaptability and strength and resilience. You know, refugees have survived incredible, incredible things. Um, and there's an, I think that like my life has been really transformed from, from seeing people and learning from them in those ways. Um, and that's just like really, really central to our philosophy is that what we're doing is, is an exchange and that that learning is bi-directional. So who are we? Um, Bright is run by a team of six coordinators. These are full-time Brown students. Um, and they, it's a, it's a very big job. They oversee and make sure that there's accountability of the 120 tutors and, um, and oversee that kind of matching. They run trainings for those tutors. Um, there's a process of selection that all of the Bright tutors go through to become Bright tutors in the first place. And the coordinators also have relationships with our community partners. So the most important is perhaps the Swearer Center, um, which we are a part of. So the Swearer Center staff are really big advisors to Bright. Um, and then we also work with the International Institute of Rhode Island, which is a nonprofit in South Providence that does all of the resettlement work. And that's responsible for um, setting refugees up in housing, connecting them to health care, enrolling students in school. And we have a really active partnership with them that the coordinators really are in charge of. And we'll get back to the significance of that relationship later. Um, the other community partner that we have is the Providence Public School Department. Department. And Bright coordinators have been really instrumental in developing connections between the PPSD and the International Institute and the refugee community in general. Um, our volunteers are you know, freshmen to seniors, people from really different backgrounds. They're a group of really wonderful, committed people. 
And our learners, uh, we have a very diverse group of people we work with as well. So we work with like six-year-olds to grandmas, um, people who've just recently arrived in Providence. So like sometimes we start working with families who've moved to Providence a week before we begin working with them, so who speak no English at all. Sometimes people are not literate. Um, and then we also have had people we work with who are really well educated and, you know, um, also, we work with people who've been in Providence for as many as five years. So it's a really big range. Providence, is, South Providence, which this top picture is a picture of, is a really different demographics than East Providence, as I think all of you know. Um, it's a pretty you know, predominantly <coughs> minority com um, community, and it's low income. Most of the schools that our kids go to, uh, only like 20% of the student body in the elementary schools are at grade level. Um, the schools are really under-resourced, and I think a lot of the institutions in the community are under-resourced. It's also got a really vibrant um, life. And there's a lot of amazing food there, and music, and wonderful things going on, and also a lot of organizations in South Providence. Um, and one of the things that, as I mentioned earlier, is really, like, really important to us is that we go to our students' homes, because um, we think that that kind of reverses a power dynamic, where we are the guests, and we are going to meet people in their places. Um, and that's, I think, really unique about Bright. There aren't a whole lot of programs that do that sort of in-home, us crossing. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our personal experiences with Bright. So I work with Tech Lay, who's in that picture right there, and he turned 10 yesterday. He's um, a refugee from Eritrea uh, and lived most of his young life in um, a refugee camp in Ethiopia. And so I worked with him, like Tara was talking about, pretty soon after he arrived. So the first thing we did was we started carving letters into flour and really thinking about what does it mean to make language his. He uh, not had really any formal schooling before, so it was this question of what does it mean to learn not just English, but to learn literacy. And I think in this experience working with him, I've really learned about you know, the power of sticking with someone and the power of, of relationship building. And it, it's, it's been a challenging relationship. He um, is an orphan here in the United States. Most of his family is in Utah. So he's had a lot of um, really a, a significant amount of loss at 10 years old. And so one question for me has been, what does it mean to, to have supports that are going to allow him to be in school and to succeed in school? And I, I think I've learned over and over again that you know trauma and these, these questions of loss really affect an ability to be able to learn. And so you know, while I think my relationship with him has been you know, incredibly transformative for both of us, I also think it makes me very aware of, of the, the structural pieces that are involved in his success in Providence. Um, so Jesse and I strangely have had similar bright experiences, and I think that they've actually been some of the harder bright experiences of people in the program, so it's sort of ironic that we then decided we wanted to coordinate the program. Mm -hmm. um, because both of the, the, the families that we work with have been through, are, have struggled a lot in being here, and um, the kids have a lot of psychological and behavioral things that they're working through as a result. I'm really sad you can't see this picture because my kids are the cutest people I've ever seen. <laughs> they're a little, they're just like, <laughs> posing in really great ways. Um, so my family is, they're ethnically Burundian. The kids were born and raised in a refugee camp in Tanzania. I started working with them um, the fir first semester of my freshman year, a week after they had arrived in Providence. So the only word we had in common was hello. Mm -hmm. um, and so the beginning of my bread experience was really about literacy building. And it was like so, I felt like I was making such a big difference because I was working with Alice, who's sitting, she has the pink shawl wrapped around her, she's really beautiful, she's now 12. And my sitting down with her for a few hours a week and going over language helped tremendously in her being able to do well in school, and she picked up English like that, because she's also really brilliant. Um, so it was really incredible in the beginning, and it was like, wow, this, this, this language, you know, that language acquisition part was a really big thing. So now, um, it's become a lot more difficult, um, and I think a lot of that has been because these people, these kids have been in um, a really sort of under-resourced place and there are not very many supports for them at school at all. They don't have the kinds of mental health help they need and even like, you know, the, their ESL teachers um, have, don't, I think don't really connect with them and work with them in ways that they really need them to. And so um, Alice has, all, like, 
she has a lot of challenges that she's dealing with and um, has made our relationship harder. And I think one of the things that I've constantly been learning through seeing her and her struggles is just the extent to which um, the consequences of resource distribution and kind of structures, and especially the, the education system, and the way that the fact that she has no resources in school for her, how much that really affects her life and affects her, um, and, the, and the violence in the community that she's. I mean, I've really come away with a really strong sense of sort of the consequences of structural inequalities. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit just in the value of Bright for volunteers and for coordinators in raising our own awareness of the kind of society that we live in and the realities that many people have um, and the consequences of resource distribution. Um, I'm saying all of this, and I don't mean to undermine what we're saying, but one thing that I've come away from Bright with is that you know, these relationships are really, really important because I know my being in my, this family's life has meant a lot. And there have been moments where at, with Alice where, um, I mean, I can, it's just been very clear that like my believing in her and continuing to show, up, to show up means a lot. But I've also learned that there is a limitation to that. Um, and that there's a way that, you know, those interpersonal connections are really, really important, but there's also this huge structural piece. And so I'm coming away from Bright believing in that work, but also being really motivated to do work um, beyond that. So, so um, we're going to just talk a little bit about what we think that each of these different stakeholders gets out of the organization. Um, and again, going back to that idea of the, the relationship, the like whole dynamic being really bi-directional. So, as I was saying, in my experience as the, a Brown volunteer, um, I think I've learned a lot about about. Um, society um, and I've also learned a lot from the family that I work with and I've learned a lot about um, their history um, and I think that Brown volunteer every bright volunteer really gets that kind of learning um, and that's a tremendous benefit I think and the coordinators um, get to know all of the families in bright so that's just like that kind of benefit and learning is um, multiplied many times over so I think um, the other thing that you know is a benefit of the relationship is just like it's really fun. We've had a lot of bright volunteers who say that their bright families are like a family away from home. Um, so that's also I think, something that's really significant. So we wanted to just talk a little bit more <coughs> about our community partnerships, and Tara obviously already started talking about them. But those are the International Institute, the Providence Public School Department and the Square Center for Public Service here at Brown. And I think what's really important to think about is the way that, that our relationships with each of these organizations um, uh, works really well together. So, you know, our work with the International Institute, we really couldn't do our work without the International Institute um, because they are the people who are experts on the families. They're resettling the families. They're supporting adults in, in gaining English literacy and finding jobs. But I think the, the thing that Bright is doing for the International Institute, we think of ourselves as really an extension of their work. We're supporting the kids and learning English at, at this really pivotal moment of transition. And then afterwards, when the International Institute isn't as involved in their lives, because you know now they've been here five years but they're still up against what Tara was talking about these real structural injustices and inequalities so and also you know our relationship with the International Institute we're really able to follow up with the International Institute about um, the families that they're working with and that partnership is integral to I think both of our successes and then the Providence Public School Department we are really supporting what the Providence Public School Department is describing as you know their most vulnerable population so we're working with the Providence school teachers, our tutors are emailing those teachers, are connecting with them, going into the schools. And you know, that's been a, definitely a, a process to gain that relationship. It's by no means easy, but our teachers are saying, you know, this has been a real support to our students and, and they're actually supporting us in developing a summer camp this summer. And then the Square Center is really this piece about thinking about student learning and student growth and how um, we, we can learn and, and build these strong partnerships. And they really care about um, partnerships that are successful in the community and not just on College Hill. So to sort of wrap up, um, the relationships, which there's a network of relationships as we've illustrated with all the different stakeholders, we think are really powerful um, for a number of ways. And I think as I was really saying that just the exposure 
for the 120 Brown students that are going is really huge and I think can, can really catalyze and inform the work that people continue to do in the future. For the young people that we work with, um, you know, we have access to a lot of resources and a kind of knowledge of navigating systems that a lot of them don't really have and so we can help kids get signed up to college prep programs or after school activities or you know help with forms and so there's a lot of ways that um, we are it's sort of the relationship that we have can kind of break down some of those barriers that they have to being able to take advantage of systems and also be able to get more resources that they kind of need. And I think another huge part for me about this idea of, you know, I think borders often sort of separate, they create others, right? There's sort of us and them. And I think that often happens here where it's like College Hill in the city of Providence. Um, and so there's this issue of humanization, and I think that this is sort of connected to what Kara was talking about um, in just seeing, I mean, for, for in our language it would be seeing just people, but I think just seeing like, how would you, how would you phrase this, um, breaking down the, the boundary between an us and them, between the cat and human. Um, and for us, I think that often, you know, South Providence and the refugee community could be a statistic to us. And that's not very personal. We don't have a connection to that. We don't know what that kid's life is like if it's just another kid in a failing school. Um, and I think that that's really, really powerful about Bright is that you know all of a sudden we have these personal connections to these stories that may not be our own. And that builds a lot, I think, of um, solidarity and potential for change. Um, and I think it's really important to doing any kind of work, social justice work. I think Tara's really summed it up, but I think we just want to reiterate again, we don't think of our work just as tutoring or as, you know, learning English. We think of literacy as a way to build power and relationships is the first thing that happens. And then learning English um, as a way to say, you know, literacy matters. Being able to read and write and advocate for oneself matters as we think about the world that we're living and being able to go out and live in it successfully. And so we think about, you know, these, these relationships as really building power within people, supporting people and having a um, more powerful and confident sense of themselves and then being able to go out in the world and you know recognize these structures but also push up against those structures and you know be able to to move forward in school and then beyond um, in, a, in a I think a more powerful a more powerful way and that you know relationships are the real vehicle to be able to do that thank you Thank you everyone again for coming. Um, thank you Tara and Jesse for that fantastic presentation as well as Kara. Um, I will be talking about something somewhat similar but slightly different. My project today is a discussion on borders but as they pertain to national borders or physical borders between two countries. Um, it's, uh, I will come back to the, you know, the, the panel theme of transcending these boundaries and bridging these gaps that they mentioned previously, and the presenters have mentioned previously uh, at the end of the presentation. But I'd just like to start quickly by, sorry, yes. Sorry, not used to a PC. <laughs> <coughs> so my topic is titled The Problem in Kashmir and the Problem of Kashmir. So before I actually begin to tell you how the Kashmir conflict has evolved over the past 60 years, and yes, it has been 60 years since the conflict actually came up to the forefront, um, let me tell you the Kashmir conflict is essentially a problem, a region over between India and Pakistan that has been uh, much in dispute, much in conflict. And there are a number of reasons, not just the territorial disputes, not just two countries trying to they claim on this piece of land, but it's also an ideological dispute. It's also a question of competing nationalisms. Who are the parties involved in this dispute? Who are the parties who have a stake in this dispute? And what are they arguing about? And what are their stance on those issues? So why should we, we as students here in America, we as you know, international people care about this conflict? You, know, you could say that this is something so regional, it is confined between two countries, it's not really important for us to discuss this. But first of all, the conflict in itself has been an absolute tragedy. For 60 years, the number of people who have been killed, not just in times of war, but also in times of peace um, in the region, has been absolutely huge. And 
The other reason, which is very, very important, is the fact that this region of Kashmir is actually sandwiched, essentially, between two nuclear-powered states. And these states are not friends with each other. So any sort of conflict between India and Pakistan always, at this stage, has the risk, or runs the risk, of escalating to a nuclear conflict. And that will not just mean disastrous consequences for the region and the subcontinent itself, but also humanity in general. So thus, this region is really the security flashpoint is, as Kofi Annan said in 2002, this is the direct conflict between nu two nuclear powered states, and which is not the case in any other region in conflict around the world. Um, so before, um, it's very important to understand the geography of Jammu and Kashmir as the Indian Union explains it. So this is the state of Kashmir, which is the northern part of India. And this orange region here is actually under Indian control. The green part is an under Pakistani control. The northern part is called the northern areas. And then this green part of the corner here on the left is called Azad Kashmir or independent Kashmir. But it's all under Pakistani control. And on the top right, you have these two very, very small areas which are actually under the control of China. So um, the state of Kashmir is not just divided <laughs> between two countries, but actually it is divided between three countries. Um, the territory with China is another issue, and perhaps uh, it's also very interesting. But uh, on the left side, on the western side, it's split between India and Pakistan. So according to the census, 2011 census, Kashmir is predominantly Muslim. And Kashmir is also, majority of Kashmir, especially the productive part of Kashmir, um, is in the Indian territory. So how does that affect the competing nationalisms of you know, the involved partners? So you know, when we talk about conflicts around the world, you know, there are reasons why, this has, you know, why there are problems. Um, you know, we talk about the Israel-Palestinian conflict, we talk about any other region of the world which is in contest, there are, there are reasons why that has come to be. And the same thing is in, in, about the Kashmir conflict. So in 1947, when India was partitioned, essentially, it was under the Brit rule of Great Britain. And when it was partitioned in 1947, two, two states were created, India and Pakistan. And then all the princely states, were, which were initially part of the Great Britain conglomerate, were asked to either accede to India or accede to Pakistan. And there were only three states, three princely states, that were in somewhat of a conflict. They didn't know which way to go, India or Pakistan. And one of them was Kashmir. And the reason was that Kashmir was predominantly Muslim, but it was ruled by a Hindu ruler. So what happened was essentially a lot of tribal warfare followed in 1947. And so India moved in and essentially signed the treaty instrument of accession with the help of the king of Kashmir, which was the Hindu ruler. And after that, of course, there was a lot of, 1947 was the first time that India and Pakistan went to war. And they have gone to war with Kashmir four times. Um, and since then, the first time was in 1947, and it was essentially over this instrument of accession which was signed. And you know, when they went to the United Nations, the argument was not over Kashmir. The argument was not over the instrument of accession. The argument was essentially over Pakistan's aggression or India's aggression in that, um, in that region. So Kashmir is not just necessarily a territorial dispute. So I just explained how you know, it's a region that Essentially, we want it because it's Muslim or it's Hindu or it's you know conflicted between two states, but it's also more than that. Um, you know, Pakistan's point of view is that Kashmir is predominantly Muslim, and the reason for partition was essentially to divide Hindus and Muslims, to make Pakistan a predominantly Muslim state and India a predominantly Hindu state. However, if you try to go back to that argument of you know again dividing Kashmir on the basis of Muslims and Hindus. Um, a fantastic professor here at Brown, who's one of my mentors, Professor Vashne, will say, how many times do you want to divide Kashmir, do you want to divide India on the Muslim question? And it's a very interesting argument that he presents. And I could go into a lot of details, but you should reach out to him, because he has great perspective on that. Um, so that's the Pakistani point of view. From India's point of view, when Kashmir was essentially made part of the Indian Union as per, as per the Indian Constitution, it became tied, or it was tied to India's idea of secularism. You know, India never wanted the two states to be divided. The Indian leaders didn't want the two states to be divided on the basis of religion. And thus, India, as it stands today, is a secular state. 
And so if India were to give up Kashmir today, essentially it would have acceded to those demands of dividing the country on religious lines. So it's essentially one of those you know, ideological things that India holds on to. And also it goes back to a lot of legal um, you know, things that, were, uh, that happened following 1947, especially with regards to the UN, et cetera, um, and saying that you know, the partition was legal and this part of Kashmir is ours and that part is yours and we really don't want to revisit this debate. And then the final nationalism that I'd like to talk about, which very few people actually discuss, is what do the people of Kashmir want? Um, and that could be described as Kashmiriyat. Kashmiriyat is this ethnic nationalism uh, which belongs to the people of Kashmir who actually overwhelmingly favor independence. Now I will let you know later in the uh, presentation why that might not be a good idea to essentially make Kashmir into an independent state. But that topic of you know, not being part of India, not being part of Pakistan, but instead being an independent state is a debate that but both leaders on India and Pakistan side do not want to revisit very often. So um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, as I said, it's a 60-year-old conflict. It's very difficult to actually put it all in a timeline and explain everything. Uh, but in the past 60 years, the two countries have actually done a lot to mediate the conflict. You know, they've gone into secret talks, they've gone into deliberations, and there have been times where they've signed even agreements. Uh, you know, one which was signed in 1972, which was actually very, very important. Um, it, not just, you know, for the first time, the two leaders on both sides of the border were like, fine, you know, we'll sit down and we'll talk about peace, we'll talk about how we can do this in a peaceful and a harmonious manner. But they also, what they did, which is very important to understand, is that the border between India and Pakistan in Kashmir was actually turned into a line of control. And a line of control, um, again, as I will explain in a bit, is very different from an international border. It's very different from a hard border. It's essentially a de facto border. It's not legally uh, recognized, but it's just some place where we draw the line and we say, that's mine and this is, that's yours. Um, and that's, that happened in 1972. Uh, following that, 99 was just another big declaration was signed, but that fell apart within a couple of months because 99 was the one war that I clearly remember in my head when I was growing up. Um, 1999, when India and Pakistan went to war over Kargil, only over a decade ago, was disastrous, absolutely disastrous. And it only ha you know, it started, and when I tell you how it started, it's funny because there were five people who crossed over the line of control into the Indian territory, and they were gunned down by the Indian um, forces. And essentially they said, well, these people are part of the Pakistani military and that's why we did so. And Pakistan for almost two months denied it, saying that no, they're just shepherds who were in the Kashmir region, they just crossed over. But essentially the United States had to step in and be like, no, those were actually members of the Pakistani military. And that escalated into one of the most deadliest wars we've seen in a very long time in this conflict. Uh, following that, there were a lot of peace uh, agreements or peace meetings that were organized between the two leaders. But the trend that has developed, which we've also seen in this country after 9-11, is that of terrorism. And cross-border infiltration from Pakistan onto India has increased to such an extent that pretty much every two years there's one extremely deadly attack in India. Um, pretty much every month there is a deadly attack in Pakistan. And it has disrupted any sort of hope or any sort of peace um, you know, conversations that two nations can have. And the last big attack was actually in 2008 in uh, Mumbai, the city that I'm from. And um, the group that basically took responsibility for it, the lashkar e toiba are essentially a group operating in Kashmir. Most of their training camps are in Kashmir, and India essentially thinks that the Pakistani intelligence services, the ISI, is the one which is funding um, this organization. So I just... Um, you know, give you a background on how this conflict, not just as a territorial dispute, but it's also, um, you know, it's about competing nationalism, it's all, all about message, all about, you know, how we perceive these nationalisms and how we perceive any sort of peace for the future. Um, so my project with Professor Long, who does a lot of conflict resolution and management, was essentially to provide policy recommendations on the Kashmir issue. Um, and so the first important thing uh, that I'd like to discuss here is how can we bridge perspectives on this issue between the two sides of the line of control. Um, you know, you have to reconcile popular discourse. Essentially, when I was growing up, there was always our history books in India 
you know, predominantly de demonized the entire partition, saying Pakistan was the reason why so much blood was shed. You know, it's the deadliest partition the world has ever seen. Um, you know, that kind of attitude, that kind of, you know, not just in curriculum, but also the media, there are right-wing political parties in India, take every opportunity that they get to you know, point a finger at Pakistan. And if you continue that, you, the generations of people, generations of young people on both sides of the border will still continue to go back to that bloody partition in 1947. And there will be no absolute hope for any sort of you know, reform, any sort of development uh, moving forward towards peace. Uh, the second point is, you know, as I said, like there have been a lot of meetings, there have been a lot of going back and forth, but essentially one of the reasons why nothing actually has concretized is because there is no institutional framework for this kind of a peace settlement. So there is no committee which is overseeing this, these meetings. There are no committee which is responsible for being a watchdog. So intergovernmental cooperation between the two capital cities of Islamabad and New Delhi has to be solidified, um, as I propose, uh, with the help of, an, of a committee or an organization of independent citizens who's, who are completely vested in the interests of you know, maintaining peace, of human rights, ensuring that violence doesn't continue. Um, third, uh, the two states have a lot of potential for economic cooperation. There are a lot of, um, you know, at, you, if you open up Kashmir to, let's say, bilateral aid donors, you could have development projects that you could build up. You could, in these development projects, you could manage to employ a lot of young people on both sides of the border, which would potentially not, um, you know, give them any incentive to indulge in terrorist activities or any sort of violence. Um, the most ambitious policy option that I propose is to create a special economic zone in all of Kashmir uh, with duty-free access to India and Pakistan. And um, this is uh, one of those, it's an option which both countries could explore and has been proposed as well by a number of international non-governmental organizations. Human rights, of course, is one of the biggest issues and very close to my heart as well. Uh, the number of paramilitary forces and um, the military in the region has been responsible for a number of violations with regards to women, children, um, you know, just with religious abuse, etc. So I think that needs to be um, um, you know, seized as well. And most importantly, both states need to recognize that these violations have occurred and that they regret these um, because those will help heal the psychological wounds. Um, here I quickly want to talk about independent Kashmir. Holding a plebiscite in Kashmir is something the two states do not necessarily want to discuss. I mean, even if they do want to discuss, they don't have the political will to do it because neither of the two countries will actually pull back the forces from Kashmir and no plebiscite is possible unless, unless the military gets out of the way. So um, that's, uh, you know, and also Kashmir in itself, the state, and as I said, there are Hindus, there are Muslims, there are a lot of Buddhists living in Kashmir. Um, and if you do allow them to conduct a plebiscite, it could so be that the entire population would be completely polarized and that would be not the most appropriate way to address this sovereignty dispute. Um, mitigating terrorism, as I said, it has always derailed talks. Um, the right picture is the Mumbai attacks in 2008, the left picture is the Mumbai attacks in 2006. Um, so terrorism is the biggest issue. Um, if Pakistan could pull back troops from the Indian border and focus more on their internal security, not fund any of these troops that India claims they're funding, um, you know, make sure the ISI is not responsible for any of these attacks, um, I think those will be important steps forward. Um, and lastly, reforming the line of control. And here I'd like to go back to the theme of our panel. The line of control, as I said, is a de facto border. It's not a hard border, it's not an international border. But how can we actually, the fact is, how can we actually move across? How can we transcend this border? Because essentially, we're one civilization, India and Pakistan. We're not two competing groups of people. We were one 60 years ago. Uh, and now we're two, and we've been fighting bloody wars since you know, that happened. And so essentially, you know, how do we perceive this line between us is barbed wire between us and is there any way we can actually cooperate across those borders because going back to where we come from we're actually just one population um so i i know i probably do not have uh, that much time professor sandal uh, five minutes okay <laughs> well um i just quickly want to give a plug um 
you know, this entire conflict is extremely diverse. It's not a simple thing to solve. I completely understand that. The talks have happened, the talks have failed, and it will continue to, the cycle will continue. There is no way that I can actually perceive peace in this region or in this conflict in the next couple of years. Uh, but I just want to say that Kashmir is honestly one of the most beautiful places on earth. And uh, I can totally see why these two boys are fighting over it. Um, but having said that, um, you know, one of the biggest, as I said, my, I, I'm, I'm an econ major as well as IR, and I completely believe that if the economic prospects of this region uh, could be improved, peace might be possible. And um, you know, one of the biggest ways to do that is to encourage tourism and to encourage people to actually travel to these places. Um, you know, I have been to Kashmir, but I know a lot of my friends would always be like, why would you ever want to travel to that place? Like, it's dangerous and you could get blown out in the middle of the street. Well, let me tell you, you know, the Mumbai attacks that happened in 2008 happened in hotels where I and my parents have had dinner on a number of nights. Uh, so there is no way to guarantee that. I could be blown up in Mumbai, I could be blown up on the streets and that, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I know I'm talking in a very, like, it's terrible to say it that way, but this place is beautiful and I think people forget that because it's been so marred in conflict, so marred in bloodshed for the past so many years that people forget how beautiful it is. Um, you know, our first prime minister said that if there is paradise on anywhere on the earth, it is here in Kashmir. So um, if any of you are interested more in learning about the conflict, learning about India and Pakistan, I'd be happy to discuss that. And also, if you'd like to travel to Kashmir, I would also like to help you plan that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. And we have got uh, 15 minutes for your questions and for discussion. So if anyone in the audience would like to? Otherwise, I'll start asking my questions. But I just want to please go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you all for speaking today. Question about Kashmir. Are there restrictions on um, visitors right now and restrictions on, like, what are the restrictions for someone in India that wants to travel to the park controlled by Pakistan? Like, how strict is it? Do um, so the part controlled by Pakistan is as per it's in Pakistani territory, so the restrictions apply the same way as they would if you were to travel to Karachi or Islamabad. So you do need a visa. Um, having said that, the part controlled by Pakistan is actually very, it's a rocky terrain. Uh, not many people actually live in those areas. So it's not um, a very viable uh, prospect to visit. Having said that, visiting Kashmir for, for an Indian is uh, not difficult at all. Um, the roads are fantastic, etc. Like, the government wants to promote that. Um, but visas to Pakistan is a completely different uh, topic, and it is difficult to, uh, for Indian citizens. And it became very difficult after the 2008 attacks, and then you know, once again, peace talks start, and things become easier again. Um, and then, so it's, uh, it goes back and forth, essentially. Any other questions? Um, so for the Bright program, you talked a little bit about how the or how the volunteers were selected, but what about the families? Like, what process happens in terms of matching families with the volunteers? Um, so that is done with the International Institute. So basically, about 200 people are resettled in Providence every year, and all of them by the International Institute. So the department in the federal government that deals with refugee resettlement calls the International Institute and the families come. The International Institute then identifies and asks people if they would like to work with Bright. Um, so, and we always, it's a negotiation with how many tutors we actually have. So there's a person, Akimana, specifically, who um, talks to the families about the program and then the families sort of sign up for it if they want it. <coughs> and then. Akimana and the institute staff sort of identify people that that they think most need it, need tutors. Does that answer that question? We have a question for Tara and Jesse as well. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on sustainability of the Bright model? So I feel like their Bright has been in existence for long enough to see uh, people have graduated and you know. Um, New, t new, uh, new volunteers have come in, um, and if we're really emphasizing the relationship aspect, um, you know, is there an emphasis on building some kind of an 
a love network so people are really encouraged to you know are we trying to create those mm -hmm. lifelong relationships I understand there's only so much that you can handhold handhold someone to you know stay in touch and all of that I also want to follow up on that because I did similar work uh, when I was an undergrad in Turkey and also um, here in Los Angeles and um, I mean, it was obviously hard for me, but I can imagine how hard it is for the uh, children you are working with because you also develop this two-year, sometimes three-year relationship and the kid sees you as this elder sister. And then, uh, I mean, of course, both programs I've worked with uh, had different parameters. But how do you facilitate that process? I'm still in touch with those families, but of course, it's a different story. I mean, I moved and now I cannot do this weekly I send cards and everything, but it's not the same anymore. So these kids are already traumatized, and this work is very important. So I'm not saying that you know this in any way um, undermines the value of the work we are doing. But how do we facilitate that process? Not breaking the, I mean, trying to mend these hearts and keep the relationship going. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, a really important question. I think we talk about it a lot on the Bright Coordinating Team among volunteers. Um, and I, I think that you know one thing we're doing is is really, you know, when we talk to people about their commitment, we're really asking them to think about the kind of commitment that they're making, and that this is a commitment about you know human lives, and this is not, you know, this is not a tutoring program only. This is not about just you know going in and and then leaving. So, but I think it is something that we come up against, of mm -hmm. course, this question. Um, and I, you know, one thing we're doing is we're consistently if someone's leaving we're trying to facilitate a transition that's that's really as smooth as it can be and we're talking to the tutors about what makes sense for their students um, but I think this alum question is a really good one and I think as we think about I think we've we've learned that bright actually does seem to be pretty sustainable in that you know it requires little money there are always people who are interested and in, and and willing to do this kind of work um, but and so in that way it's really sustainable but um, making sure that these relationships are sustainable I think is a is a different question and I would add because I think that so that this is yeah <laughs> you know well this tension is always there about you know, the, the more personal the relationship, sort of the more powerful and the more supportive, and yet then the more damaging when, those, when the student leaves or if the student drops out. And I've seen that in my family multiple times because there have been a number of tutors who've actually left. And the kids always ask me, like, where did this person go? Why mm -hmm. did they, do they not care about me? You know, it's, um, so I think one thing we've been talking a lot about more re this semester is, like, there's this personal relationship between the, men you know, the, the mentor and the learner, but there's also, like, there could be more of a relationship between like the bright program and the individual people and so one some of the things that we're trying to to develop to make that that relationship stronger which i think is actually the more sustainable relationship is like a summer camp which Jesse is heading up which is a phenomenal achievement there's going to be a 6 week full time summer camp for 40 kids and that's where you know there's bright this program that has this kind of institutional long term support for these for these young people and and so other you know like community building and kind of getting that sense the other part of it that i would just say and i think kind of addresses it is like one of the, what we're trying to do is work ourselves out of a job, and we're trying to build. And this goes back to you know how Jesse closed up the present the our presentation about the idea of of like this relationship as building capacity and power within people themselves. And I think that like the ideal is that we are able to connect our young people to other resources and get help them be in a place where they can be really strong and get themselves through things too. Um, and so at a certain point, you know, the hope is like maybe the relationship isn't as needed. Of course, <laughs> the extent to which that happens is, is yeah, hard to say. I have one more follow up that it kind of just made me it's based on what you were just saying, um, which is in my mind, like. I would imagine that being a refugee from, say, Burundi versus Eritrea is very different, right? But I'm wondering how much of a kind of identity you see, like, is there much of a refugee identity that you've seen kind of, and kind of a potential for people to feel this as this common experience um, in coming to the U.S., kind of transcending other sorts of, I mean, obviously, language barriers <laughs> from people from different parts of the world, et cetera. Um, and if that seems like a very strong bond, because I can imagine it kind of being the case or not. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question and I think it's actually really important because um, and I've learned more about this from working with the Institute and like 
refugees more generally. Um, but I think that refugees get grouped together, and that's more of a false grouping than it is in reality for many of them. And like, you know, for example, the Iraqi refugees that we've mostly worked with, a lot of them are coming as engineers and doctors and lawyers and people who had a really different reality than people who are coming whose backgrounds are as peasant farmers. And so their kinds of transitions and the kinds of challenges and um, identities that they're struggling with and arriving here are really different and the experiences that they have. Um, so I actually think that 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 category of, I mean, refugee explains like what they're coming from but doesn't is not very effective in explaining where they're coming. That being said, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think I, I do Bright because I love the people because they're just amazing. One of the things that I've seen um, in the classrooms in the International Institute, they teach life skills and literacy classes to the adults. And I was working there for a summer and it was this classroom full of a lot of like 60 year old, 70 year old people from all over the world who like were really great friends and had these great rapport with each other even though they couldn't even communicate with each other and they were coming from these really different backgrounds. So I think that 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 there also is a way that like you know people form friendships and bonds and like um, closeness with each other <coughs> too. Yeah. And I just want to echo you know I think last summer at summer camp one of the tensions that arose was actually between ethnic groups between the Burundian community who's you know it was, it was the the camp was actually in a church that a lot of them attended um, and with other communities of refugees so there were these attentions that arose out of you know differences and also the fact that coalition building had happened before camp started so among Burundian refugees who already really knew each other and Eritrean refugees who already knew each other and Nepalese and etc but then part of the I think role as we think about this question of sustainability and building bright as a as a structure and a model in Providence is uh, thinking about how bright can do some of that work of coalition building among youth who are now living in Providence and experiencing similar things in you know displacement within the Providence public school so that that can be a sort of long-term goal of Bright as we're having these community events and now the summer camp. So we will uh, collect the questions and then uh, close the panel giving each uh, participant some time. Why don't we start with? Um, this question is from Asu and I think there's two aspects of the question so I hope I articulate it in a way that makes it clearer. Um, one is, it seems to me, and from my personal experience, that it's a very personal conflict for both Indians and Pakistanis. You know, for Indians who were forced to leave Pakistan during partition, you know, everyone seems to be pushing their own agenda, where, you know, for Pakistan also, it's a very Muslim ideological question, and for India, it's like, if we let Kashmir go, you know, or is Hyderabad going to go, want to go, et cetera. So, um, you know, while India and Pakistan are both pushing their own agenda, what do you do with the disillusioned Kashmiri population that has been mm, failed by both India and Pakistan? You know, how do you rejuvenate that population to really believe? If you say that an independent Kashmir is not a viable option, how do we get that Kashmir to believe in either side? And the second part of the question is, how can the international community get involved in that? Um, kind of not, you know, we've tried to get India and Pakistan on the table multiple times, and as you know, that's not going anywhere. So, you know, what should the international, how, how do you see them getting involved? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Um, I have a question for Tara. Um, I was just really interested in how you talked about sort of six months into your relationship with Alice, um, it almost became harder. Um, and I'm just sort of interested in your thoughts about how we're talking about breaking down borders and how working to improve their literacy was in order to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. But did you ever feel like sometimes it increased the distance between you two that mm -hmm. you didn't have this like sort of goal of literacy to work on, now that was passed? Um, and now you sort of saw a lot more of her psychological behavioral issues, but mm -hmm. you know, where the borders increased because of that. Mm -hmm. okay. I have got two questions for uh, one for Kara and one for Vasundra. And uh, for Vasundra, it's how about the Indian citizenship? And officially, you were talking about the edu education uh, you are going through. So, what can be done in order to make it more inclusive? 
Although, of course, India is a democracy. We said, I mean, Turkey is a democracy too, but you can, you can uh, talk about the details. But um, I mean, the, the work I'm doing is like, although we say that we are secular, there is a very important Sunni Muslim identity to the core of the uh, Turkish identity. So, and we reiterate this in the books. I can imagine, this, actually, I have a thesis student next year who will work on this topic on India. Uh, like, so if you have a core Hindu identity, which is reiterated in books and education, doesn't it alienate the Muslim component in the community? So how does it contribute? For Kara, and I mean, I, I cannot believe that I'll ask this question, given that I'm sober, it is morning, and uh, <laughs> it's, so we have got this understanding of like cat person and dog person in the society. So I'm a cat lady and I'm a dog person, this and that. So when you are looking at your thesis, when you are looking at that, like, and also, when you say cat lady, it is not as good as a dog, dog person. So cat lady is some, something of an anomaly, right? I mean, it is, she'll be single, she will have <laughs> six, seven years. I know it about myself. I mean, this is, this is how I see myself as well. So, um, so what are the, do you go into these differences? There's a huge difference between the dog personality and cat personality because we attribute these things to cats and dogs. So how do we see this difference? And how do, how do you, I, I, I'm really new to this type of research. I, I don't even know how to pose this question, as you can see. But uh, you haven't really talked about like, how, how it is different, like being a cat. And like the, the, the personality we attribute to a cat, right? So um, how do people approach cats? And is there a really difference between like, a cat person and a dog person in your experience in the shelter? Because I worked at the shelter too, and there's a huge difference. I observed, but I just wanted to ask you about your research and how it played out. So why don't we give each of you guys two, three minutes? I know it's really uh, hard to wrap up. But in two minutes, if you can just try to answer the questions, then at the end of the panel, we can hang out a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start with those the and then we'll come. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Prerna, for those questions. And I think they're both very, very important questions, which I couldn't fit it in uh, the presentation. But essentially, one of the most damaging things to the conflict has been the rhetoric on both sides of the border of mind control, essentially. Um, you know, as you very correctly mentioned, it's a very personal conflict. A lot of, you know, people were displaced. The most important casualty or the fallout of the partition was displacement of people. Millions of people were forced to move, migrate from one side to another, uprooted completely from their lives. Um, and that personal issue that they took to that continues even till today and has been handed down generation by generation. And a lot of that rhetoric today is currently fueled by a number of right-wing, um, you know, either the right-wing media, the right-wing political parties, um, or sometimes even older people. You know, my grandfather, he, you know, he fought in the partition struggle. You know, he's a Gandhi follower, Gandhi believer, and he still thinks Jinnah was responsible for all the bloodshed that happened. Um, and it's difficult to sit down with. I mean, it, I mean, I completely respect him. You know, he lived through it, so I, I have no point to stand up and you know say something. But um, you know, there, that, that's why I say like you need to converge the perspectives. Um, the fact that the conflict took place so long ago, and the partition essentially, um, and the fact that we still continue today to you know, marginalize the two communities is not going to help us at all in the future. Um, and this you know, personal conflict of always being like when there is an India-Pakistan cricket match going up, there's always people like standing up and revisiting the partition moments. It's just, it's, at this point, it's like, really, like, you know, it's been so long, generations of people have come and gone. Um, so it's very important to actually, you know, change our history books, change how we teach our students, our kids, you know, change how we, you know, we need to talk more about, you know, <coughs> discourse needs to be more about peace and resolution and, you know, state building and making sure that both countries, even though we partition at the same time, India today is much, much at a better standing than Pakistan, and the state is essentially failing pretty much. Um, so the discourse needs to be changed, and I think that's important. With regards to Kashmiris in, within Kashmir itself, and I think I completely agree, they'll be like, you guys are fighting over us, nobody wants to hear what we have to say. Um, and in an independent Kashmir, I think when I said that it's not a feasible option, not because I don't think the people don't deserve to tell us what they want, or that their opinion is invaluable, but only because of you know structural reasons that I feel that it's not going to survive. Um, you know, it would be another state thrown into chaos. 
absolutely. Um, uh, with regards to what the international community should do, I think um, you know India and Pakistan have both clearly stated that the Kashmir issue is a bilateral issue. They do not want any other country to get involved. Having said that, Kashmir issue has been used for a number of proxy wars, essentially being played out in the international arena. The United States is considered a friend for India as well as Pakistan, <laughs> and um, so it's uh, you know there are a lot of different international players. There's Pakistan, there's China, and the United Nations who could play a very crucial role um, in proxy ways. Uh, with regard to your question, Professor Sandal, I think you know I completely agree. A lot of rhetoric could alienate the Muslims in India. Um, having said that, I actually studied abroad in Turkey. I spent eight months in uh, Turkey, and I completely agree. It's a, you know it's a secular country, but at the same time, it's predominant 99% Muslim. You know, having said that, in India, I think. You know, Muslims are a minority, but there are a lot of other smaller minorities as well which play an equal role on the political front. So let's say there are Christians, there are Buddhists, there are Jains. Um, so I think that what lends India a much more secular character. Um, having said that, I think you know there are a number of Muslim Indians who are such integral parts. One of our presidents, our, one of our most loved presidents, was a Muslim, uh, you know, APJ Abdul Kalam, and he was. Fantastic. So I think um, there is, you know, a move to include Muslims in, within the country, and I think that was the reason why we did not, want, the Indians didn't want partition, because then we would have divided the country on those lines, and we wanted to stick by the principles of secularism. Um, so I'm really sorry, <laughs> but uh, yes. Yeah, so I, I think there is, there could be a potential for that kind of disengagement, but that is the active, you know effort made by the Indian government uh, to include the Muslims, to include the um, Hindus equally, as well as other minority groups. Thank you. And we, we, we have two minutes left because there's another panel here. So if you can take a minute each uh, to answer the questions, if you will. Sure. Uh, your question um, was about the differences between um, cat people and dog people. Feline gaze and canine gaze. So if you can just... Um, unfortunately, my project um, was uh, located only in the cat room in the shelter. Um, you know, there I didn't really go into where the dogs were, so I can't really um, comment on the differences. But I think what your question was really asking was sort of a human um, attribution of ideas on uh, various types of people who like cats versus dogs. Um, you know, that's very interesting, but I didn't really look at the discourse um, surrounding that. Um, I was trying to fill a gap in what I perceived to be um, in uh, multi-species ethnography as completely ignoring the non-human half mm -hmm. of the human-non-human -human, um, relationship. So I was trying to um, sort of get inside a cat's head, um, which may or may not be possible, yeah. and sort of Lovely positing thing. the different ways in which we might be able to see that. Okay, thank you. I, we can pass. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so thank you very much all for the great presentation and the audience as well.